Okay, so this week we're looking at chapter 4 and chapter 5. Chapter 4 goes through some cell structure, and then chapter 5 starts to get into some cell function, but we're going to carry that cell function idea through the next couple of weeks um, as we talk about cellular respiration, and then we talk about protein synthesis, transcription, translation. Um, so we're going to start with talking about the structure of cells. And so living organisms are made of cells. If you think back to figure 1.2, our original figure that we said was going to kind of be a roadmap for our semester, you can think about the fact that it started with the molecular level of organization and then went to the cellular level of organization. Um, and that's where we're starting to get into living organisms or biology. Last week we looked a lot at chemistry, and that's the kind of thing that's um, kind of common to living things and non-living things. Now we're going to take those macromolecules and start to put them together in cells. And so here's where we're really getting into the biology part. Um, organisms can be just a single cell or can have lots of different cells, like plants and animals, fungi, some other uh, organisms like that. Um, cells were first described in 1665 by Robert Hooke. And um, in Pinterest, I have a couple of um, images pinned. If you follow me on Pinterest or if you just get in there to look at some of the boards that I have, um, that the, my username for Pinterest is on your syllabus so that you can take a look at that. Um, if you go to the board on um, cell biology and cell structure, there are several um, images that were uh, sketched by Hook after he first started to build microscopes to try to look at cells in different things. Um, and he first started out by just uh, seeing cells in cork, which are actually uh, what's left behind uh, when dead cells die. There's a space that's left behind. Uh, in the bark of cork trees, and then he started to actually look at um, live organisms. We now have uh, enough evidence that we have this cell theory that states that all living things are composed of cells, and all cells come from other cells. So we can't just make cells out of thin air. Cells actually reproduce to make other cells. The way we see cells is by using microscopes. And there's two different kinds of microscopes that we use. One is a light microscope that actually passes light through a very thin specimen or a thin section of a specimen, and the lenses magnify the image. The other kind of microscope that we use is the electron microscope. This uses a beam of electrons. We can either pass that beam through the specimen, that's a transmission electron microscopy, um, or we can bounce the electron beam off the surface. And that gives us, if we do scanning electron microscopy, that gives us a really good surface view of an organism. Um, so this image in the center shows us the cilia on the surface of this organism. This image gives, this figure gives you an idea of the sizes of things you can see with each different type of microscopy. Um, the light microscope can show us details of things um, down to bacteria, and then past that, we really need an electron microscope to really see details of different things. Um, and there's a number of uh, microscope images that I have pinned in Pinterest. Um, both in different sections, um, based on different, like, human systems, as well as uh, there's a whole area on tissues that shows different types of cells and the cell biology board. Now, when we talk about cells, there are two types of cells that we talk about. Um, all cells fall into one of two categories. They're either prokaryotic cells or eukaryotic cells. Prokaryotic cells are things like bacteria, single-celled organisms. Eukaryotic cells are things like plants, animals, 
all cells have some very common features. They all have a plasma membrane, and we're going to discuss the structure of the plasma membrane. They all have a cytoplasm or cytosol inside. They all have DNA organized into one or more chromosomes, and they all have ribosomes that help make proteins. All cells have these four features, whether they're prokaryotic cells or eukaryotic cells, whether they're animal, plant, a fungus, whatever type of cell it is, it has at least these types of features. Prokaryotic cells are older than eukaryotic cells. They're usually smaller, and they're much simpler in structure. They will have basically those four elements from that previous slide, maybe some cilia or flagella on their surface. Eukaryotic cells have membrane-bound organelles, these structures inside the cell that perform very specific functions, like the nucleus. And we're going to talk about those um, as we go through the structure of eukaryotic cells. So here's an image from your book. Uh, on the left, they're showing a transmission electron micrograph. Um, in your book, they give you the magnification, 26,000 X. Uh, so this is magnified 26,000 times. And then they kind of give an artist's rendition to show some of the parts that we're looking at. Uh, so, there's a plasma membrane, there are ribosomes, there's an inner region, the nucleoid region, that's where the chromosome is, and then there's some flagella to help this particular organism swim. The eukaryotic cells end up being more complex. Where prokaryotic cells do not have organelles, eukaryotic cells do have these membrane-bound organelles that are each going to have a specific function. When we talk about eukaryotic cells, there's another distinction that we can make, and that's in plant cells versus animal cells. Uh, they are fundamentally similar because they are both eukaryotes. So there's just a couple of differences to talk about. And those differences are a couple of organelles that are found in animal cells or not plant cells or vice versa. In plant cells, we find chloroplasts, which help convert light energy into food, and a cell wall to help protect the plant cell. We don't find those two in animal cells. In animal cells, we have lysosomes that we don't find in plant cells. This is a kind of a, a blob of membrane that contains digestive enzymes. And we're going to talk more about that structure and function in a little bit. So they show you an idealized animal cell and an idealized plant cell. And these images show you everything that could be in an animal cell. Now, some animal cells have more or less of these different organelles, depending on how specialized they are. So you may have a cell that's specialized to make, for example, steroid hormones. Well, that's a lipid, and the smooth ER is what makes lipids. So cells that need to pump out a lot of steroid hormones have a lot of smooth ER, kind of filling up almost the whole cytoplasm with this smooth ER. So cells can become differentiated, can become very specialized, they have a specialized function, and in that case, they may have more of a specific organelle that helps them with that specific function. Your book uses this figure kind of as a um, icon throughout the chapter, and as it talks about each part, it highlights each part. So on page 60, when it's talking about the membrane, it highlights just this yellow part where it shows that icon next to the plasma membrane. Um, and then when we get to ribosomes, it highlights just these blue ribosomes on page 63 next to the heading that says ribosomes. It lights up just the endoplasmic reticulum on page 64, just the Golgi on page 65, 
So it kind of is pointing out the different parts by highlighting them in their color as you go through um, the chapter. So a typical cell is surrounded by extracellular fluid, and it has a cell membrane, and that's going to separate the outside from the inside. The inside of the cell can be a little bit different because it has the cell membrane, sometimes also called a plasma membrane or a plasma lemma. It forms the cell's outer boundary and can help with physical isolation of what's inside the cell. But it can also regulate exchange inside and outside the cell, and sometimes even create some structural support. It's very fluid. Um, in the learning materials tab, there is a um, folder called cell transport. And you will probably take a look in that folder related to the next chapter. But there's a few really good videos in the beginning of that chapter that just give you an idea of how fluid this membrane is. We call it the fluid mosaic model because it's made of a mosaic of several different kinds of molecules. The main molecule is a phospholipid, the sea of lipids that you see in those videos kind of stretching across the surface of the cell. Those lipids will act as a barrier to certain substances and gives the membrane selective permeability. Now also, there are proteins and other molecules in the plasma membrane. They can act as gatekeepers to kind of let certain things in when the cell needs those certain things to be inside the cell or outside the cell. So they show you here the structure of the phospholipid. It kind of has this head group and it kind of has these tails that stick down. The head is very hydrophilic. It's made of some polar molecules. Um, it has some oxygen, some phosphate, some electronegative atoms. So there's a lot of polar covalent bonds in that head group and that makes it very hydrophilic. The tails are made of fatty acids, so they are very hydrophobic. And so when you put these, these phospholipids into aqueous solutions, this is the association that they take, where all the tails try to associate with each other. All these hydrophobic molecules stay toward the inside of this molecule, away from the water outside and inside the cell. And so these hydrophilic head groups form the boundary between this inner lipid layer and the watery solution, the aqueous solution that they're in. And then there are proteins that can be embedded in this membrane. And they can function to help things get into and out of the cell. So because of these phospholipids, we end up having this inner layer that's very hydrophobic. The fatty acid tails make this inner portion extremely hydrophobic. Only the things that can dissolve in that lipid layer or things that are hydrophobic can go through that membrane. It really helps create a very specific barrier. And in the next chapter, we'll talk a little bit about that selective permeability function of the membrane. Now, plant cells, in addition to the cell membrane, have a cell wall. It's made of cellulose, and it helps to maintain the shape of the cell. It keeps cells from absorbing too much water. So the first um, organelle that your book starts to go through is to look at the nucleus. And the nucleus, the macromolecule that we most often find in the nucleus is DNA. We find a lot of DNA in the nucleus and some RNA. So we have a lot of nucleic acids in the nucleus. These store information and help to tell the cell how to make proteins. 
The nucleus is separated from the cytoplasm by a double membrane that's called the nuclear envelope. And there are pores in that nuclear envelope that allow things to get into and out of the nucleus. And so here's a blow up of the image of the nucleus. It has this nuclear envelope, this kind of double membrane. They've cut it open so that on the inside, you can see that there's lots of strands of DNA. All these faint strands that they're showing you are all strands of DNA. The nuclear envelope is actually continuous with the endoplasmic reticulum. Because the nucleus and the endo rough endoplasmic reticulum are going to work really closely together to make proteins. DNA is stored in the nucleus as the long double helix of DNA, like we've already looked at, wound around proteins. And the DNA wound around these proteins form fibers called chromatin. And chromatin can be wound up into a chromosome. And so here's the double helix of the DNA. We wrap the DNA around proteins called histones. And we wrap those up and wrap those up, and that forms chromatin. And we can wrap that up and wrap that up and wrap that up to form these long chromosomes. So there's a lot of DNA on the inside of every cell. It has to kind of stay organized without getting tangled. By wrapping it around these proteins, then we can do that. Now, the next organelle that your book talks about are ribosomes. Now, ribosomes are in both prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. This is one of the organelles that's in both. It's responsible for making proteins. Ribosome components get assembled in an area of the nucleus called the nucleolus. They get made, but then they come together with the mRNA in the cytoplasm to make the protein. They can either make proteins while they stay free in the cytoplasm, or they can start to attach to the outside of the endoplasmic reticulum. That makes the endoplasmic reticulum look rough under the microscope, so that's where we give it the name rough endoplasmic reticulum. So these subunits are made in the nucleus, and then they come together in the cytoplasm with the mRNA to help to start to make this protein, this string of amino acids that we're going to fold up like we talked about in the last chapter. If we look at um, a transmission electron micrograph, we see all of these little dots are ribosomes. And some of them are free ribosomes, and then some of them are attached to the ER, these membrane-bound plates of organelles. The DNA is going to direct the synthesis of a protein. The DNA has the information for how to make a protein. The DNA never leaves the nucleus. DNA stays in the nucleus of the cell. If the DNA ever leaves the nucleus, the cell will kill itself. It's pretty disastrous for the cell. But the proteins are made on the ribosomes that are in the cytoplasm. So we have to get the information from the nucleus to the cytoplasm. And we do that by transferring the information into a molecule called messenger RNA, or mRNA mRNA can exit the nuclear pores and go to the ribosome where it can be translated into a protein. So this is similar to a figure that we had in the previous chapter that just had a white background that showed DNA and RNA and protein. Now they're showing you the organelles where this takes place. So this purple nucleus with these nuclear pores, that's where the DNA lives. The DNA makes a copy of itself as mRNA. That mRNA can leave the nucleus 
and go to the ribosome, and it tells the ribosome the sequence of amino acids to make into the protein. And that process is called transcription and translation, or protein synthesis. And we're going to talk about it in more detail in a couple more chapters. The next organelle that your book talks about is the endoplasmic reticulum, or the ER. We can have rough ER or smooth ER. Rough ER has the ribosomes on the outside. That's what makes it look rough. So rough ER synthesizes protein. Smooth ER synthesizes lipid. Here's the figure from your book. The so rough ER has ribosomes on the outside of it. Smooth ER looks more smooth. And at the bottom, there's a transmission electron micrograph that shows you just how different these look under the microscope. So the smooth ER doesn't have the ribosomes, the dots on the outside of it, like the rough ER does. Now, all of these organelles are made from the same membrane. That same phospholipid membrane that we talked about, about the plasma membrane, is the same membrane that makes all of these membrane-bound organelles. It's the same fluid membrane, and it's so fluid that parts of it can pinch off and form what's called a vesicle. A vesicle can pinch off from the end of any of these membrane-bound organelles. So what they're showing you here is that a ribosome making a protein has attached itself to the outside of the ER. And it's fed this protein into the ER as it was made. And now this protein is going to start to undergo the steps of protein folding. It gets packaged in this vesicle. This vesicle buds off from the ER. And this transport vesicle is going to transport this protein to the Golgi. The Golgi apparatus is going to finish making this protein and preparing it to be secreted. If this protein needs some carbohydrate stuff on it, the Golgi can do that. If it associates with other subunits, the Golgi brings them together. The Golgi is just flat stacks of membrane-bound organelles. And again, the transport vesicle from the rough ER can fuse because the Golgi is made from the same membrane. The Golgi can receive this protein, can transport it through the different layers, can package it in a vesicle. That vesicle can fuse with the cell membrane and dump the contents outside the cell. That's called exocytosis, and we're going to talk about that toward the end of this lecture. Another membrane-bound organelle is a lysosome. It's a small membrane-bound sac. It's about the size of a vesicle, but it contains digestive enzymes. And these enzymes can break down all of our macromolecules. So if a cell takes in food, it can fuse a food vacuole with the lysosome to digest the food. Or if there's a dead or dying organelle, we can fuse that with the lysosome to break it down. If there's a protein that has been not folded properly, we can fuse that vesicle with the lysosome and break it down. So all these membrane-bound organelles that we've talked about so far form something called the endomembrane system. Their membranes either connect directly or we get transfer of these membrane segments because we blab off these portions that form vesicles that fuse with these different organelles. So in this figure at the top, in purple, they're showing you this rough ER. Once that protein gets made in the rough ER, it can get packaged in that transport vesicle. 
that's tra that transport vesicle fuses with the Golgi. The Golgi finishes preparing that protein to be secreted. And once a vesicle comes off the Golgi, there's a couple of things that can happen. It can just store the contents for a while. If it's a misfolded protein, it can fuse with a lysosome and digest it, start all over again. Or it can fuse with the cell membrane and be secreted from the cell. In the learning materials tab, there is a folder on the endomembrane system that you're welcome to take a look at that has some animations that explain this membrane flow through this endomembrane system. We have a couple of organelles that work on energy conversion, and those are chloroplasts and mitochondria. Um, chloroplasts convert light energy from the sun to chemical energy. When we're hungry, we don't just go sit in the sunshine. We eat a plant, or we eat an animal that ate a plant. We cannot convert sunshine into food energy. Plants can, and they do that because they have chloroplasts. Chloroplasts are unique to photosynthetic cells, and they perform something called photosynthesis, which converts light energy to food energy. And then we eat the plant, or we eat an animal that ate a plant, and take that food energy and convert it into ATP, the kind of energy our cells use for cell work. So this is kind of a picture of a chloroplast. Um, it has these structures inside of it that give it its green color. They are what absorb the photons of light and start to convert them into chemical energy. Now what animals have are mitochondria. These are the organelles of cellular respiration. They're found in almost all eukaryotic cells. And what they do is they take the food energy from the plants and turn it into ATP, which is energy that our cells can use to do cell work. Now, mitochondria and chloroplasts have their own DNA. This is a picture of mitochondria. Um, it has two membranes, or a double membrane, and we're going to kind of talk about um, how the mitochondria work when we get to chapter six on cellular respiration. So like I said, um, mitochondria, sorry, humans and other animals don't have the capability of turning light energy into the kind of energy our cells need. We can't go sit in the sunshine when we're hungry. Instead, we eat a plant, or we eat an animal that ate a plant. Plants can take light energy and undergo photosynthesis and turn it into chemical energy. We have mitochondria, and that takes this chemical energy, puts it through something called cellular respiration to make ATP. Now, mitochondria and chloroplasts contain their own DNA that encodes some of their own proteins, like enzymes. And so we've evolved this theory that the mitochondria and the chloroplasts used to be prokaryotes that were free living, that were undergoing photosynthesis or cellular respiration. And at some point, phagocytosis took place or some other process to take them up into cells. And it ended up being mutually beneficial for those prokaryotes to live inside of the eukaryotic cell. This is called the endosymbiotic theory. Endo meaning inside, symbiosis meaning mutually beneficial. And so this is a theory for how we evolved to have mitochondria and animal cells and chloroplasts and plant cells. That the, this theory of endosymbiosis kind of explaining how that came to be. Um, and there's a folder in the learning materials tab with a couple of links about endosymbiosis that you can take a look at. Now the last organelle to talk about is not really a, a membrane-bound organelle. 
the cytoskeleton of the cell provides mechanical support, um, an important protein uh, structure in the cytoskeleton are microtubules. They help the cell maintain their shape. They're found in cilia and flagella. And they are also found um, inside the cell as the cells divide. The centriole helps microtubules to separate chromosomes. We'll talk about that as we get into mitosis um, a little bit later in the semester. So we've gone through all the organelles of animal and plant cells. We've talked about the nucleus. You might want to consider making a table that kind of gives for each of the organelles the name of the organelle, something about its structure, something about its function, and maybe a macromolecule that can be associated with that organelle, something that organelle makes or synthesizes or that can be found in that organelle. So for example, the nucleus. Nucleus has a lot of DNA and RNA. So nucleic acids are associated with the nucleus. The rough ER makes proteins. So there's a lot of proteins associated with the rough ER because of the ribosomes that are found on their surface. Smooth ER makes a lot of lipids. And in your table, you can write what's different about smooth ER from rough ER. Um, once proteins are made in the rough ER, they go to the Golgi apparatus. The rough ER can sometimes be thought of as a manufacturing facility. Golgi apparatus kind of packages and gets ready to ship secretory products of the cell. Then we talked about energy requirements. And in an animal cell, that's a mitochondrion that goes through cellular respiration to make cell energy. Uh, we talked about the structure of the plasma membrane. We, the centriole we're going to talk about in a lot more detail when we get to mitosis. Uh, this helps to organize the microtubules, and it's going to be important when we get to cell division. A lot of similar structures can be found in the plant cell. The chloroplast is something that's unique to the plant cell, and the cell wall is kind of unique to the plant cell. So now that we've gone through the structure of the cell in Chapter 4, we can start to look at Chapter 5, which is going to look at cell function. And there's two main topics that we're going to cover related to cell function. One is how things get into and out of the cells, and the other is how cells make and use energy. And I'm actually going to present these in the opposite order as they're presented in your book. Because I think how things get into and out of cells builds immediately on what we were just talking about with the cell membrane. And how cells make and use energy is going to dovetail very nicely with what we're going to talk about in Chapter 6 about cellular respiration. So I think Chapter 4 leads into how things get into and out of cells. And then how cells make and use energy leads really well into Chapter 6. So that's one of the reasons why I wanted to kind of reverse that order a little bit. So in the last chapter, we talked about the structure of the cell membrane. We talked about phospholipids. So phospholipids have a head and these fatty acid tails. This head is very hydrophilic. Sorry. Not easy to write with a mouse. And these fatty acid tails are very hydrophobic. And so they don't like water. They're extremely hydrophobic. When we put those into the cell membrane, they associate so that these polar heads face the cytoplasm and the outside of the cell. And these lipids all face each other. So all the hydrophobic stuff can be as far away from the water as possible. Membranes also have proteins in them. And these proteins can have a couple of different functions. They can be enzymes. 
So we're going to talk about enzymes a little bit later in this chapter. Uh, they can help hold two cells together. They can do lots of different things, but one of the important ones is cell transport. And so that's the function of proteins that we're going to talk about in this chapter. Remember that proteins have to be folded properly in order to function, and that their folding can be very specific for their function. Now, when we talked about the membrane before, we talked about that phospholipid bilayer. We said that that can affect membrane permeability. Things that can go between or go through the lipid layer in the center, like gases, water, and small lipid soluble molecules, those are things that can pass freely through the membrane. But anything that's polar or charged or too large cannot pass through the membrane. In that case, we have to use proteins to act as channels and transporters. And so here's where you're probably going to want to start looking at some of the videos that are in that cell transport folder in the learning materials tab. In that cell transport folder, you're going to start seeing some videos that talk about this selective permeability, the fact that that inner lipid layer can keep out anything that is polar or charged, those things just bounce right off the surface of the membrane. So we said, we so because of this, we say the membrane is selective permeable, or it has selective permeability. This is the property of the cell membrane. It's the characteristic of the cell membrane. And it's like that because of these phospholipids, this inner lipid layer. Now, before we talk about these types of transport, we're going to go back and talk about our terms related to solutions again. We've talked about solutions, solvent, and solute. We talked about those in Chapter 2. The solvent is what does the dissolving, and the solute is what's being dissolved. We use the analogy of making Kool-Aid. So when you make Kool-Aid, you put in an envelope of color and flavor molecules, put in a cup of sugar, sucrose molecules. Those are all solutes. And then you add water, which is your solvent, to make your Kool-Aid, which is an aqueous solution. But what happens if you don't add enough water and your Kool-Aid is very thick or concentrated? What happens if you add too much water? And your Kool-Aid is very dilute, weak Kool-Aid. So the concentration of a solution is how much solute is present. And we can have a difference in concentration in two different areas. So we can have a concentration gradient. For example, inside the cell versus outside the cell. Also, when talking about these transport processes, we can talk about whether or not they use energy, whether they're passive versus active. So the first type of transport, the first way that things get across the membrane of the cell, is a process called diffusion. Now, molecules like to spread out. Molecules have a little bit of energy, so they're constantly vibrating. They like to spread out as much as possible. And so diffusion is the movement of molecules so that they spread out evenly. They move from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. They move down their concentration gradient, and they just spread out. And so here they show you some dye molecules on one side of a membrane, and they just try to spread out. Over time, they spread out until they're equally distributed. Now, this is for molecules that can freely pass through this membrane, and that's going to be lipid-soluble molecules or gases. The second type of transport that we're going to talk about is osmosis. Osmosis is going to be the movement of water down its concentration gradient. 
And here we have the definition of osmosis. This definition might make a little more sense once we actually go through a little bit of our explanation. When we talk about osmosis, there is a term that you hear a lot, and that's tonicity. And tonicity is looking at the concentration of solute outside the cell. So we're looking at what kind of um, solution we're putting our cell in. And there are three terms to describe that concentration. You can have a hypertonic solution. That's where you have more solute outside the cell. You can have a hypotonic solution. That's where you have less solute outside the cell. And our third state is you can have an isotonic solution. Iso means same. So you have the same amount of solute outside the cell. What happens if we put a cell in a hypertonic solution? Hyper means more. Tonic means solutes outside the cell. So hypertonic is more solutes outside the cell. But if we're looking at a selectively permeable membrane, these solutes might not be able to pass through. Water would be the only thing that could pass through to even out this concentration gradient. So we need to figure out where water is. If you have a hypertonic solution where you have more solute, it's like having your strong Kool-Aid, your concentrated Kool-Aid, where you didn't add enough water. So here you have less water outside the cell. Water will move down its concentration gradient to even out this difference in concentration. So if we look at what happens to a cell, if we put it into a hypertonic solution, this hypertonic solution has lots and lots of solute. You can tell that here because they show you this dark blue background. Lots of solute. There's more water inside the cell than outside. Water moves down its concentration gradient and moves out of the cell. The cell will shrivel up. That's what happens in a hypertonic solution. Hypo means less solute outside the cell. Hypotonic, less solute outside the cell. That means there's going to be more water outside the cell. This is your weak Kool-Aid. Look how light blue that background is. Very weak Kool-Aid. Lots of extra water. And so water is going to move down its concentration gradient to go into the cell. The cell will swell up and burst. But in an isotonic solution, where the inside and the outside are balanced, a cell can have a normal configuration. So let's go back to our definition of osmosis. Over here, our definition says osmosis is diffusion of water across a semi-permeable membrane or selectively permeable membrane in response to solute differences. So there's two things that we need to have. One is a selectively permeable membrane, and two is solute differences. If you don't have a selectively permeable membrane, the solute could move across the membrane in order to balance out. It's the fact that we've trapped the solute 
to make a concentration gradient that forces water to move. If it was a freely permeable membrane, that solute would just move across the membrane. The other thing we need is the difference in solute concentration. We need either a hypertonic or a hypotonic solution. If you don't have any concentration gradient, there's no driving force for water to move across the membrane. And you won't get a lot of movement of water. Our third type of transport is facilitated diffusion. Now, sometimes you really do want to get that solute across the membrane, and it's not permeable. Here, we're going to need to use a protein, a transport protein, to get it across the cell membrane. We don't need any energy input because things are still moving down their concentration gradient, from high concentration to low concentration. So here, we have facilitated diffusion. It's still moving from high concentration to low concentration. Things are moving down their concentration gradient. The only difference between facilitated diffusion and regular diffusion, these solutes in diffusion can freely pass through the membrane. So these are lipid soluble or gases. In facilitated diffusion, they're not soluble across the membrane. So they have to have a protein to help them. Then our fourth type of transport is something called active transport. Active transport is going to use energy. So active transport can pump things against a concentration gradient. Here we don't have to care about the concentration gradient. Solutes can be transported across the membrane using energy from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration. We can pump things up to a high concentration. Here's the example that they're showing in your book. Now that we're using ATP hydrolysis, we can start to build things up to a high concentration. We don't have to just let them roll down the hill. We can actually build things up to a high concentration. Now, sometimes we actually want to move large numbers of things across the membrane. So far with these transporters, we're only talking about moving one molecule at a time. And so we need some way to have some kind of bulk transport. This goes back to the idea of vesicles that we talked about in the last chapter. Here we can use vesicles to get things across the membrane. Exo means outside. Exocytosis secretes things outside the cell. Endo means inside. Endocytosis takes material in by vesicles. So exocytosis is shown in this figure. From outside the cell, we have this vesicle in the cytoplasm. It can fuse with the cell membrane. And I really like this figure because it's showing you that these are all made of the same phospholipid bilayer. And so we can fuse this vesicle with the phospholipid bilayer of the cell membrane and dump the contents outside the cell. And if we're dumping the contents outside the cell, that's exocytosis. Endocytosis takes things into the cell. We kind of take, we kind of form this pouch or invagination of the membrane that fills up with material. Then we pinch off a vesicle to take things into the cell. And then this vesicle can fuse with other parts of the endomembrane system made of this same phospholipid bilayer. So that's a summary of the different ways that substances can get across the membrane. Either one at a time by diffusion, facilitated diffusion, or active transport, or in bulk using these vesicles. Now the next 
function of cells that we're going to start to get into is the function of making and using energy. We start with just a general discussion about energy in this chapter, and then we're going to actually make um, a little bit more detailed discussion in chapter six. So what I'm actually going to do is to put the majority of the rest of this PowerPoint with chapter six all together in a lecture since they work so closely together. So the last part of this chapter that we're going to look at kind of talks about energy in a very general way. What is energy and how does it relate to chemical reactions? We're going to talk very specifically about a molecule called ATP. And then we can start to talk about how we make ATP, which is a process called cellular respiration. That cellular respiration is the topic of Chapter 6. So that's why I'm really comfortable putting the rest of Chapter 5 with Chapter 6 so that we can kind of look at energy and respiration as a whole.